Oh, I'm sorry. As they say, she's Put you on the spot like that. Welcome to the Tuesday, February 12th, 2013 school board meeting. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, item one, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Nothing. Okay. Um, item two, the approval of school board minutes. I think we can probably do this as a slate. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the school board minutes as a slate in item 2A on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Second. 2A through E. 2A through E, please. Second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7 0. Okay. Um, we have one student representative who I understand is, is working tonight, um, but Nolan is here. So, Nolan, if you're prepared to uh, represent the high school, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, definitely something big that's being talked about around the school is the, the doors. Um, uh, I've, I've personally been, been asking students what their opinions are on, on what's going to happen, just to get a little more, bit more student input. Abby actually had a meeting, uh, attended a meeting with some of the students I was out that day um, about some of their thoughts. Um, some of the most, the most common questions uh, would be, uh, one, the fact that most school shooters are people who attend the school, students who attend the school, and also um, will, will this, uh, big fears, will this interfere with uh, seniors coming and going uh, as they do throughout the day? Um, so those are the two biggest things I, I encountered while asking students. Um, also, right now, uh, Winterfest is going on at the high school. Uh, it's planned by the sophomore class. Uh, theme is Hunger Games, and that's uh, going well. Um, and seniors are submitting their STP ideas by Friday. Um, t uh, that's a senior transition project for uh, those of you who don't know, um, where for the last two weeks of the school year, seniors uh, kind of will, will volunteer at, uh, at a workplace and kind of get to experience a little bit of what that career might be like. Um, and also winter sports are wrapping up. Um, we're getting into some of the playoffs and, and uh, final, final play with winter sports. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Nolan? I have a question for Nolan. How is Nainer Day on Monday? Oh, well, Maynard Day wasn't, wasn't very, very distinct, considering most people just wore flannel and, <laughs> like, bean boots. So people basically wore almost the same as what they wore. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm not seeing representatives from any other school, we usually do the middle school first. If so, okay, good, I didn't want to miss that. Well, thank you. No problem. Um, so on to item four, um, comments from the public on agenda items. Do we have any comments? No. Okay. Um, item 5A then. Um, our Uruguay USA Ecuador exchange program. I believe uh, Susan Dana and Ana Rodriguez is here. Um, the board may recall that um, Susan was chosen as um, a, a US um, uh, 
Fulbright Educator Exchange person this year, and Ana Rodriguez is visiting the school district right now. She was here for our epic snowstorm, um, and Ana's had a very full schedule. I think if you looked at her itinerary, you would be tired just from reading it, um, but she's kept herself very busy, but Senora Dana is going to introduce Ana and um, Anna, who is joining us to translate this evening. Um, yeah, good evening. So I think we'll start out with, bueno, ¿quieres que hable yo? Oh. Yes. Okay. Primero, okay. Um, well, first of all, um, <laughs> this is Ana Rodriguez from Pan de Azúcar in Uruguay, in South America, and she just started her study of English in September. So we are we will have a translator here to help you and, and to help her. And our translator is going to be Ana Stressinger. Yeah, I'm thinking in Spanish. Anna, Anna Stressinger, sorry, who graduated from Cape High School in 2006. <laughs> and we've kind of maintained, we've been in touch, and she's been a volunteer in my classroom to come in and talk about trips that she's made in Spanish-speaking countries, kind of as a result of the, uh, the Foreign Life to Say the, the World Language program that we hear in the middle school. So anyway, make a long story short, Anna is going to translate for us this evening. And I'm just thrilled to have her here. Thank you very much for taking time to, to do that. And uh, she did translate for us. Um, Ana Rodriguez was at the Lions Club. She actually founded the Lions Club in Pan de Azúcar in her city in the year 2000. So she, was, she went to the Cape Elizabeth Lions Club and, and talked. And uh, Anna Stressinger translated the entire the presentation for an hour. And she did a wonderful job picking up the nuances of the language. And so anyway, I'm thrilled to have um, Ana here. Maybe I'll think Ana Rodriguez would like me to, to start to kind of jump in. And then she'll talk. But I just wanted to. Um, it's, to say it's just been a wonderful experience having Ana here, and I would just like to really thank you. Call her the aventer, uh, Aventurura. She's a real adventurer, because we didn't even know each other. The Fulbright matches us up. We did one or two email exchanges, and I had a student make a sign to hold up in the airport, and I took a picture of the sign, and I emailed it to her. I said, well, look for me. I, look up, I did send a picture of me, and I'll be holding the sign. Um, so it's really, when you think of it, she's never flown before, she's never been, on, been out of the country before, and here she's on this great adventure, and she's going to spend two weeks with this person she's never met before. So anyway, it's worked out really well. But I would like to thank her for, she has just been, we've been running from sunup to sundown, past sundown every, every single day, so it's been a, a great experience. I just want to, um, a few things I do, I do have, I don't, maybe I'll make my presentation now, and then we'll just go to the next, but... Um, I did take her to L.L. Bean, and our plan was to go Saturday. It was a very full itinerary. Obviously, didn't make it because of the snow, but we went on Sunday. I said, you have to at least walk through L.L. Bean, because it's kind of one of those things. You go to the Portland Headlight. She's been to the Cape Elizabeth Transfer Station. Um, <laughs> we, Becky's, whatever. So we've just been trying to see some classic main things. But um, kind of a, a classic, if you want to maybe translate this, a, a classic gift for a teacher in Maine is to give them an L.L. Bean bag and have students sign it. So I thought that would be a good gift for her from, from, the, from the students. No puedo creer. Can you say Maine? I wanted oh. to, I was trying to get Cape Elizabeth. I didn't realize you're only limited to 10 characters. So we went with Maine. But so the students have signed it for her. And inside they've written some, some, bueno, some cartas para decir, wow, well, you could oh. I'm thinking in both. But anyway, so they've written her some thank you letters about what they've learned and what the experience ha has meant to them. And uh, I just would like to read a few, just some of the letters, because it was really striking to me the value of this in the classroom and how it impacts student learning. Um, so just a few, dear Maestra Ana, they did learn that they call their teachers by their first name in Uruguay, but it's preceded by Maestra, it would be like teacher Susan, teacher Ana. Um, having you in our class was an interesting experience. I've met very few people from South America, and it was very cool to hear a native of Uruguay speak Spanish. I also learned about the diverse culture of Uruguay. Many thanks. Uh, thank you so much for visiting our school. It was very interesting to learn about Uruguay. She talked about a tea that she, that's very typical of Uruguay, so a lot of the students mentioned the tea. I didn't know much about Uruguay's culture before you came, but now I know it's a beautiful and safe place. I hope you had fun in the United States. We have never had a foreign teacher before, and the experience was new, but great. Thank you so much for visiting our class. I learned a lot more about Uruguay, including the climate, population, and economy. It was really interesting to learn about the culture of your people, and I enjoyed hearing about the different pronunciations of words in Uruguay as well. There's a different dialect in Uruguay from Spain and from Central America. Um, I had so much fun learning about your country, and I hope you enjoyed Maine. 
I'll just kind of end with this. These are sixth and eighth graders who wrote these. Thank you for coming to the United States. I hope you enjoyed your flight. I've always dreamed of going to South America. When you visited our school, in a way, I got to visit South America. And I was surprised to learn that the US has so many similarities to Uruguay. So those are just a few of the letters. And every single letter is so meaningful like that. The students did a really good job writing, writing letters for her, to her. So, um, so I would like to present Anna. There are other projects we're doing, but I think maybe I'll wait till I come back. I'll be going to Uruguay in July and spending time with her in her school. Um, Anna did just find out the day of the snow day. I heard her screaming and yelling at 5.30. Because I told her, if you hear the phone ring, it's an automated call. But it's a little bit too early. So she got a call, and she found out she's going to be principal this year for a school. Mm -hmm. She applied to be principal. Mm -hmm. So she'll be principal next year. So I'll be going to a different school than was anticipated. But it will be, it's a school that's K through 9. So it actually kind of works out better for me as a middle, middle school teacher. So anyway, she was yelling downstairs at 5.30 in the morning because she's going to be a principal. <laughs> <laughs> See? Um, so anyway, Anna, this is, I just present to you on behalf of the middle school from Mr. Purley, the interim principal, and, and everyone at the middle school to thank you for your time and patience. And she's repeated her dog and pony show probably about 100 times. She went to Pond Cove today. So anyway, thank you. Bueno, gracias. Bueno, ahora te toca a ti. Thank you. So now I will turn it over to Anna. Bueno, yo quiero agradecer enormemente todas las atenciones que he recibido desde que llegué acá a Cape Elizabeth. So she wants to thank everybody for everything that she's received ever since she's come from Cape, to Cape Elizabeth. En especial al director y a las profesoras de lengua del middle school y de high school y primary que me han recibido abierto las puertas de sus aulas y me han permitido aprender y conocer más sobre la vida estudiantil en Estados Unidos. And she wants to thank the principals of all three of the schools, elementary, middle and high school, and the teachers of the schools for allowing her to see uh, how, uh, welcome, welcoming her into their classrooms and allowing her to see how we do education here in the United States. Para mí ha sido una experiencia maravillosa haber tenido la posibilidad de visitarlos, de visitar Maine, que es un estado que nunca me lo había imaginado, que el, allá en Sudamérica lo vemos en películas, y yo le decía a Susan que veo las personas, los personajes del pueblo, el pescador, el señor que junta la nieve, y me parece que salieron de una película. <laughs> que she, that she feels very fortunate to be able to have experienced Maine, that it's a place like none she's ever seen, and that uh, only seen on, in movies. And to actually see the fishermen and see people shoveling snow, it was as though she was in a movie. <laughs> Además, me ha impresionado mucho el orden que hay en la ciudad, la amabilidad de, de la gente entre sí, entre el vecindario, eh, el saludo, el orden en la escuela, eh, en, eh, los estudiantes son muy independientes, saben dónde van, saben dónde vienen, nadie tiene que llamarles la atención y eso me ha impresionado mucho. Porque en Uruguay no sucede lo mismo. Uh, she's been very impressed by the amount of order and organization there is in our cities, in our streets, and as well as in the schools, as well as uh, how friendly people are to one another. And uh, she was very impressed by the fact that students know exactly where they're going and at what time in the school. And uh, that's something that um, isn't necessarily as, as common in Uruguay. Y bueno. No tengo palabras para agradecerle a la señora Dena y a su esposo que me han recibido en su casa como si fuera de la familia sin haberme visto nunca antes y ella me decía sos aventurera porque tú no nos conocías pero el primer mail que ella me mandó me parecía que la había conocido de toda la vida. And she feels very fortunate to be able to have stayed with 
Mrs. Dana and her husband that they've been extremely welcoming and friendly, and that uh, Senora Dana tells her that she's an adventurer be for coming here because they don't even they didn't even know each other. But with the first email that she received from Senora Dana, it felt like they had known each other for a long time. Y bueno, el programa de Fulbright tiene el propósito de eh, hacer conocer o hacer mejores las relaciones de los países de Estados Unidos con los demás países. Y creo que el, la, firmemente que el objetivo lo están logrando porque realmente me voy con una impresión de este país maravillosa que quisiera visitarlo más veces y que ya con Susan, como le digo yo, eh, tenemos planes, muchos planes para intercambiar con nuestros alumnos y pienso que no va a terminar ahora nuestro proyecto, sino que va a seguir por bastante tiempo más. In the Fulbright program, the idea is to improve relations between the United States and other countries, and she feels like it's really achieving this goal, uh, and that she has, is going to leave the United States with a great impression of it, and wants to come back, and that she and her, student, she, her students and uh, Mrs. Dana's students are going to continue doing an exchange. So this, even though she's leaving soon, this, won't, this isn't the end. Bueno, thank you. Gracias a todos. Y quisiera, tra eh, en mi ciudad, en Pan de Azúcar, hay una autoridad que es el alcalde y me dio para que trajera unas plaquetas de eh, nuestra ciudad y se la quisiera ofrecer a la señora Nero. Nero y al señor Walsh. Walsh. <laughs> uh, the town council of where she lives, Pande Azúcar, uh, has sent her with plaques, two plaques, to present to Mrs. Nato? Nato? <laughs> and Mr. Walsh. So it's a memory uh, from her city to yours. Wow. That would be very nice. Beautiful. Very nice. Esa cruz es porque estamos la ciudad está a la falda del cerro que se llama Pan de Azúcar y que en la cima tiene una cruz que se puede visitar es un lugar turístico y es el emblema de nuestro pueblo. So the cross is a tourist destination and it is up on a hill. Sí, so you can see it from the city below. Uh, so, in, in the spirit of that, um, we have we have a gift for for you. So, um, what would a trip to Cape Elizabeth? Oh, 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 So I, I think we also would like to recognize Representative Monahan Derrick, who's here tonight as well, with a presentation for Anna. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> so Susan and Anna, what? 
trip wouldn't be complete without a legislative sentiment. So, <laughs> Senator, <laughs> so Senator Rebecca Mill and I are very, very happy to present you with a state of Maine legislative sentiment es un honor para mí. acknowledging and welcoming you here to Maine and visiting our great state. <laughs> Good luck translating what a legislative sentiment is. Muchísimas <laughs> gracias. <laughs> sure, I'd be, well, I'd be happy to read it. It's not very long. It's, not, yeah, it's pretty short. And this was, um, we also presented you with a, two or three copies of the House calendar on that day that um, acknowledged your visit. So, State of Maine. Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing Suzanne Dana of Cape Elizabeth, a Spanish teacher at Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and Ana Rodriguez, a teacher from Pandazucar, Uruguay. The teachers are the 2012-2013 recipients of the Fulbright Teacher Exchange, sponsored by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the United States Department of State and implemented by the American Councils for International Education and the Fulbright Commission. During your time in Cape Elizabeth Middle School, Ms. Rodriguez will work with students and staff and visit all three Cape Elizabeth public schools to learn about education in the United States, to share her Uruguayan culture and to participate in main cultural events. We send our appreciation to Ms. Dana and Ms. Rodriguez for their commitment to education and extend our best wishes for a successful Fulbright teacher exchange and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Millett, and thank you, Representative Monahang Derrick. We appreciate your being here. And thank you, Anna, for translating, and thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know there's been a lot of excitement in my household where I have one elementary school student and one middle school student who are, who are very enthusiastic about your visit. Um, and thank you, Susan, for everything you do to enrich the World Language Program. She's without words to so thank you. She's so overwhelmingly happy and, and excited and, and thankful for having this opportunity. And congratulations on becoming a principal as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to item 5B, the mock trial team. And I believe we have Senator Millett. Again? Yes, we do. And Representative again. Monahan Derrick is And Representative Monahan, Monahan Derrick again. Again. <laughs> Lucky you. You're supposed to go up here. <clears throat> well, we're very pleased to be here this evening to share with the um, Cape Elizabeth mock trial team a legislative sentiment in honor of your achievements. Uh, first, I would like to say congratulations also to the very dedicated um, mentors and volunteers, teachers who helped the team achieve what it has achieved, and also the parents who probably uh, undoubtedly have an important role to play in, in supporting their efforts also. So I will read to you what the sentiment says. Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the members of the Cape Elizabeth High School mock trial team, who are the 2012 Maine State High School mock trial champions. This is the third year in a row that Cape Elizabeth High School has won the championship. The team, which is coached by Cape Elizabeth High School social studies teacher Mary Page, will represent Maine at the National High School mock trial tournament in Indianapolis, Indiana. We congratulate the members of the team on their winning the state title, and we send them our best wishes on their future endeavors. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine, 
Given this 15th day of January 2013 at the State Capitol, Augusta, Maine, was sponsored by myself, Representative Monaghan Derrick, and Representative Hellman of South Portland, and Cape, he also represents Cape Elizabeth. So please come and receive your sentiment. Congratulations. Nolan, do you need to go join your team? Oh, sure. Uh, Nolan, come on down. I was going to say Nolan should come on down here. We will be very brief. Um, one of the things I want to correct right away, and not correct, I want to add to is I am the social studies teacher and I am the teacher advisor coach, but we are joined by three attorney coaches who have helped make this three-peat um, possible. One of them could not be here tonight, Dick O'Meara. He's a local attorney. He gives a great deal to the community. He has been a coach with uh, the mock trial team since 2004. Joining us this year was a CEHS alum from 1998, John Sarbeck. He looks like one of the kids back there. Um, <laughs> he is an assistant attorney general for the state, and so he's graciously giving his time and traveling with the team as we go to Indianapolis for the national championship. And finally, we have David Hillman, who helps uh, coach us as well, and I think it's these attorney coaches that have helped really launch the team along uh, so greatly. Um, finally, I want to thank the community because they have been so supportive now as we fundraise especially, and the team because the kids have been outstanding, uh, just outstanding to work with, uh, fun to do, uh, to be with all these years. They're going to make very brief comments. Uh, three of them are captains. Uh, mock trial is a timed event. The kids know the value of brevity. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Josie Barth, and I'm going to talk about uh, what I've learned from mock trial. So I joined the team uh, my freshman year because I've always been interested uh, in law, and I started off as a timekeeper, uh, which might not seem like a very important role, but it is, especially when you're in court and two lawyers get mixed up about their times, and then they have to argue, and then it comes down to the timekeeper who's right. So it's a very important job. Uh, but then sophomore year, uh, like uh, most captains here, uh, we moved on to be uh, attorney roles and definitely that experience of uh, learning how to ask questions, you like the proper format, um, learning about the rules of evidence, uh, that was definitely very interesting. It's very time consuming but also very rewarding when you're actually in court in front of a real judge. Uh, wearing a professional suit that's coordinated by Miss Page. You can only wear black and white, no colors, no painted nails, nothing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess just the professional aspect of it and um, being able to be in a courtroom and really show off what, what you learn and all of the time and dedication that it takes um, in terms of public speaking and just learning about the law, that's definitely what uh, you learn the most from mock trial and definitely uh, I would encourage anyone who has middle, middle school students who are going into high school uh, to join the team because it's really fun. Thank you. Hi all, my name is uh, Seth Dobieski and I'm a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School um, and I wanted to express uh, the mock trial team's um, jubilance at winning, the, uh, at winning the mock trial state championship for the third time. Um, in three years and uh, express our enjoyment um, and our excitement to go to Indianapolis um, this year. And just briefly, uh, I wanted to um, say that mock trial is awesome. It's indubitably the greatest arena in all of, uh, in all of uh, life, I would say. Better than, it's better than the Stanley Cup, it's better than the World Series, it's better than the Super Bowl. Um, it's where all the action happens and it, 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 it gets overshadowed by athletics and by um, other clubs at the school, we don't uh, always get the credit that we, we feel we deserve. So, um, go mock trial. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'm Chelsea Wynott, and I just wanted to briefly thank all of the groups that have made this possible for us. Hey, Abby. <laughs> Including, um, yeah. <laughs> Including CIF, the HSPA, and our administration at our school. And I also want to thank our coaches. Of course, Ms. Page is wonderful. 
and she teaches us how to dress and how to speak and to not say um. And our lawyer coaches, Coach Sarbeck, Coach Hillman, and Coach O'Meara, who's not here tonight. And of course, thank you all for having us here tonight. Thank you, Chelsea. David? I did want to say one, a couple of things, obviously. Uh, Seth, you're wrong. Uh, I'd rather be in the Super Bowl than the courtroom. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I, I do think it's important to emphasize that, that mock trial is not just learning uh, evidence rules, trial procedures. It's really learning how to think on your feet, critical thinking. Witnesses don't do what you expect. Um, you have to learn to, unlike normal classrooms where you by um, this will sound pejorative, but a lot of times you just regurgitate information and assimilate information. In mock trial, you actually have to think, you have to adapt, you have to react, and it's, it's, it's a great learning experience. It's, it's a lot like life. And I, I also am impressed. Um, I do watch a lot of athletics. I was in athletics in high school. The amount of time these kids put in is astronomical. It is. Uh, long, I would have to say that, uh, and now they're doing it again for the Nationals, they put in more hours per day than any team I know. And it's, and it's hard work. And it's a lot of fun to teach them. Uh, but thank you. Uh, and I would just add that uh, I've, I've had the, the privilege of, of joining this team for the, for the past two years, and I would not s have selected a more perfect group of individuals to represent this state and this town on a national level. These guys are exceptional. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Good luck too. Good luck. <clears throat> Top 20, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. So while they are on their way out the door, <laughs> it's, w it's wonderful to celebrate the opportunities we have in Cape Elizabeth for uh, experiencing world, world culture and for learning experiences like my trial, but not all learning experiences are easy and some are more difficult. And so by way of a segue, um, Jeff Shedd is here now to talk about uh, su substance abuse, which is an issue um, in the community and, uh, and, and also in the schools. So thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. Um, so we have sort of a four-part presentation, um, and I am going to be using that, and I don't know what that means in terms of the board, if you want to, for about 15 minutes or so. Um, so I suppose either look around or come out here and sit, whatever, whichever works for you. So, so what I want to do is I'm going <clears> to <throat> set the table by really trying to condense a couple of presentations that have been done recently. I hope that my battery has, computer has plenty of battery life. Um, so what I want to do is talk about um, what we think we know based on the best knowledge, best information we have about what the patterns of substance use are among high school age students in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I want to give a little bit of background about the school board policy, which we do our best to enforce. <clears throat> I think um, school board members who are parents of high school students may be the most familiar with the sort of the details of the policy, but I will tell you it's a complicated policy and I get lost in it sometimes, so I thought it would be helpful to just sort of go over the background a little bit. Um, and then what I'd like to do is talk for a couple of minutes about uh, the work that we've been doing um, and the presentations we plan on doing to students and have already started to do. Um, uh, as part of what we've called our aftermath committee. So that's kind of the title that we've given to ourselves. <clears throat> and after I'm done, um, I'm going to introduce Joyce Nito, who's our substance abuse counselor at the high school, and then Julie Ewald and Cindy Garfield, who are the leaders of the HOPE organization, which has been working on this issue for the past six years, I think it is, are going to present for a few minutes, and then we're going to wrap up with um, Andrea Kerr, who is our health educator uh, in the high school to talk about sort of substance issues and how they're covered in the health curriculum. So that's kind of the plan. Um, I am going to give to you at the end of this entire session copies of all these slides, but I have a feeling that if I gave them to you now, I'd be, that'd be a bad teacher move because then you would start, start uh, shuffling through them. So I'm going to try to take you, take you on a walk through uh, 
what we think we know. So um, this is based, the data that I'm going to share with you is based on uh, the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, which is given every two years uh, in students in grades 7 through 12 across, across Maine. Um, I understand from Mr. Purley that, I don't know why that's doing that, I've got plenty of battery life, but I can hit it many times if I need to. Um, I understand that uh, his students took the, this year's Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey yesterday. The high school students are taking it tomorrow. Um, everybody is encouraged to do it in the last week before a major vacation. There's a reason for that, but I'm not going to have time to go into it. Um, based on the latest survey um, data, um, there is some... Why is this not kicking in? Hmm. Hold on a second. I may have to go to plan of leave this technology. I did practice this with Eric Kramer two hours ago. It worked perfectly, and it will work perfectly again. I've just got to figure it out. We do have the paper copies, Mr. Shepard. Yeah, if I need to do that, that would be so <laughs> not cool. <laughs> Keep Elizabeth secure. How can it be? It's not possible. It's clearly possible. All right. Let me try something. I am using, by the way, or I'm fumbling with, a uh, program called Reflection Software, uh, which is a piece of uh, software that's on my computer. And it's supposed to be, and it was, allowing me to run, to show through my computer what is on my iPad. And it's stuck on the first slide. Okay, I think. What? Okay, I'm going to have to, this is too bad. Um, anybody has any clever ideas? I don't know why this isn't working. Let me try. I think I can run for that, but let me just see. Let's quit reflection and let's run it directly from here. That might work too. Okay, we'll do it a different way. Maybe. Yes, we will. Okay. Um, So, um, sorry, for the, sorry for the interruption. Um, there is some good news from the data, and the first one is, the first piece of good news is that there is, from 2009 to 2011, which are the last two years that this uh, uh, survey was given, um, what it shows is that the direction in general for among our students is lower use um, than was reported two years before that. Um, you will see in these slides, um, the first three are relate to middle school data, and you can see very low use in every single slide. And I'm not going to go through every one and talk about the details, but I just want to show you what you're seeing. In this slide, the fourth blue line is Cape Elizabeth High School 2009. And the question is, how many people in the last 30 days have had at least one drink of alcohol? And it shows you that level for that. And then in the next, the next bar is Cape Elizabeth High School 2011. Um, and the decline is what I wanted you to see. Um, and the comparisons are high, the, the um, high schools in the state overall in that same survey year, 2011, 
uh, which we are lower than, and Casco Bay schools, which is sort of a, uh, an aggregate of schools that we typically compare ourselves to, Yarmouth and Falmouth and other places like that. Um, so I wanted you to see, and I'm not going to discuss these in great detail, but here the question is about binge drinking, and you'll see again the high school data 2009, then a drop and a, and a lower than average numbers compared to the state and lower than average to the other Casco Bay schools. Similarly, about use of marijuana, uh, a drop from 2009 to 2011, and being lower than the state and lower than Casco Bay schools. So, um, why is that drop happening? I have no idea. And I'm not claiming credit for it. I'm just pointing it out. The only thing that I can think of systematically that and this is my hopeful side that I'm hoping might be a, is, is the good work that Hope has been doing over the last six years to try to open up the conversation in the community around substance abuse issues. I do think um, people are talking about it more and sort of the mission of Hope, the theory, the premise of Hope is the more people talk about a topic which in communities like Cape Elizabeth is historically not talked about, the better off the community is. But whether that's the cause or not, I'm not sure because this isn't scientific. We can say that the usage is down, but we can't say for sure why that is. Some other good news is that parents send the right messages uh, to kids in Cape Elizabeth. These small bars are the numbers of students who report that their, their, their parents either say it would be not wrong at all or a little bit wrong for their students to drink alcohol regularly. So the bars are very small. I don't think you have to worry about the numbers so much, but the bars are really small. The same thing is true uh, about using alcohol regularly, and the same thing is true for smoking marijuana. The bars are really small, so that's good. Um, oh, and the same, yes. Oh, and this is showing actually the grade level breakdowns. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. There were slides in there, but in every case, here there's a little blip in terms of grade 11 students, and then it goes down in grade 12. I don't, you know, I'm not sure how to explain that, uh, but that's the case. Prescription drug use rate overall is very low. Um, and you might ask yourself then, well, why did I send out an email to all parents recently about, um, about Adderall use? And that is because I had had a number of reports that suggested that particularly during around midterms week, when that stress level gets really high, there was reports, at perception at least, so I wanted to address that. But in terms of the data, you can see again um, that the trend 2009 to 2011, <clears throat> according to that data, is down. And again, lower than um, those comparison bands. We're talking about such no low numbers of difference. I can't claim that those are statistically significant, but they're interesting. Jack? Yes. Quick question. The, on Adderall, the real abuse of Adderall is doing it with the doctor's prescription rather than without it. And that question asks how often do you use it without a doctor's prescription? Kids have learned the game in the system. Well, some have, but there is also a suggestion that, that kids who, um, the, the point of the email was really not so much kids who have a legal right to use it with their prescription, but for kids who get it from others who do have that legal right. right. And that's what this is all about. Right, but the New York Times article showed you how you answer the 30 question questionnaire in a way that everybody can get a prescription. It was about over prescription, right. right. Yep, two different issues. But, but again, this shows the grade level breakdown, and now I want to talk about the not so good news. Okay, we can compare ourselves and find some good news, but, but that doesn't mean the issue isn't there. Um, one of the pieces that I think is clear as a trend, <clears throat> usage of every substance more than doubles, more than doubles between sophomore and junior year. Um, so here is the more than doubling between 10th grade and 11th grade all the way up to 50% in grade 11, and then it's slightly over that by grade 12. This is drinking alcohol past 30 days. Okay, similar thing. Jeff, what year is that? Is that the 2011 data? Yes. Uh, let me go back to that. Yes. It's the same thing. Ooh, this, this is grade, I'm sorry, this is grade level data. This is 2011. Yes, it, yes. Yes, it is, Joe. Thank you. Yep. So this shows the same thing in terms of binge drinking. I'm going to actually come back to this slide a second time because I think it deserves second, uh, separate sort of uh, discussion or recognition. And this is marijuana use, again, more than doubling. That's sophomore to junior year, um, which I think coincides with just a general sort of uh, feeling one's independence. 
I think it's not, not coincidental that it also coincides with the years when kids are getting driver's licenses, uh, which is that greatest sign of independence. Um, some other not so good news is that most teens do not believe that they will be caught by their parents if they use. Um, so this is the alcohol number. If you used alcohol without, your, without parents' permission, uh, the percentage of students who said they probably would not or definitely not be caught by their parents. So the significant majority do not believe that they would be caught. That number becomes even more dramatic when you look at the grade level breakdown. I mean, you could, I mean it's a perfect slope of a line uh, from grade 9 to grade 12. Um, by grade 12, three quarters of students don't believe that they will be caught by parents if they drink alcohol. Even though parents send to them the signal that we think it's wrong. It's not a matter of the signal, it's a matter of, of identifying and doing something. Um, a too large minority says they have been offered drugs on school grounds. That's not good news. Um, this again shows 2009-2011, uh, the comparison of high school, state, and Casco Bay schools. Um, this shows the grade level breakdown and I don't want to minimize the importance of, going back to that slide, a quarter of our students roughly saying in the past 12 months, if you look back over the, the last year, at least one time they have been offered drugs on school grounds. The question is a bit ambiguous about whether or not it's just talking about or it's actually transferring. So different kids would interpret that different ways. Whatever it is, it's a concern. And this is the slide I said I wanted to come back to. Uh, over one-third of juniors and seniors report binge drinking in the 30 days prior to the survey. That to me is the most alarming statistic. Even though our numbers compared to the state don't look out of whack, um, that's the group of kids who you're concerned about in terms of uh, the possible journey towards addiction and dependence. And it's certainly the group of kids that one would be concerned about in terms of will they be alive to receive their diplomas and graduation. Um, and Cape Elizabeth has too many experiences with students who are not. Um, so those numbers are concerning. Now I want to just give you a quick, relatively quick walk through the policy in terms of how it works. This is a digested version of a presentation that Troy Henninger and I have made to students um, over the past several days. Um, today we met with ninth and 10th graders last, sometime last week, last Thursday I think it was, we met with the 11th and 12th graders because one of the things that came out of the incident that took place in December was an awareness that despite the fact that the policy has been around for a long time, despite the fact that it's reviewed by coaches and everybody, that there's tremendous myths and tremendous confusion still about the policy. So we decided we should go through that, an understanding of the policy. So this is not the school board's words, but I think it's consistent with the spirit of the policy, explaining to the kids really the policy has two purposes. And the first is to give students who are so inclined not to use, who are looking for a reason not to use, a good excuse to say no. Um, and I think it works with, with many kids, but it certainly doesn't work with everybody by any means. But the second, the second reason, which I think is, and I'm not rating these or ranking these, it's to get help to students who need help. So, one of the confusions that was uncovered by a result of a couple of incidents is there are some people have been under the assumption that tobacco isn't covered, and it is under the policy. In fact, it's treated exactly the same way as marijuana or prescription drugs that are used by kids who don't have prescriptions um, and other things that are more commonly recognized. And one of the odd, interesting messages that kids get is it is actually legal for students over 18 to smoke. Um, but it is actually against school board policy um, and so there are consequences under the policy for using tobacco products. Um, so that's what I just said. What actions are covered? Um, use, possession, furnishing, sales, being under the influence, negotiating or arrangement to transfer a sale orally by text message by iPad. And I have to say that our policy is actually a little bit ambiguous about this. This is the the, it, it says use, possession, furnishing, sales, being under the influence, those are all clearly unambiguously covered. What's not covered is if a student is not under the influence on school grounds, not in possession, but is using their iPads, their iPhones during school to make arrangements to transfer drugs off school grounds, is that covered? 
My position as the person who'd be required to enforce the policy is I think yes, I think that's, I think that's consistent with the spirit of the policy, but it actually would be something that um, uh, merits some discussion. I know the school board is interested in looking at the policy. Um, what if the activities are off, did I cover everything from that slide? Yes, I did, that I wanted to. Okay, what if the activities are off school grounds? Okay, the policy covers, and I think board members are aware of this, two types of things, two types of fences under um, the school board policy. And one is all those use possession stuff on school grounds or at school events. So field trips, in hockey arenas, cheering for the team, um, those sorts of things. Um, and obviously being on school grounds literally. And then off school activities for students who are involved in certain covered activities described by the policy. And I'll come back to what those covered policy, uh, uh, activities are in a bit. But there is one non-use, non-possession, non-under-the-influence sort of violation that is also covered by the policy, and that is if a student hosts a gathering at his or her house or property, then it's the violation of the host, even if the host doesn't use, doesn't possess, is not under the influence. Unless the student who is the host takes steps, either by informing the parents or the police, to bring an end to whatever the gathering is. And this applies under the terms of the policy, even if the student who's the host didn't want to be the host. Or even if the student planned a gathering of four intimate friends and text messages and Facebook and everything all of a sudden resulted in 40 kids showing up. The responsibility is, according to the policy, um, to take care of that event. So what time period is covered? This is the biggest myth that students had, and if I, we told students last week and today, if they got nothing out of, else out of the presentation we did, that we hoped that we would, they would get this out of it. That the policy covers from the very first day of school until the very last day of school. So starting with, if the students are fall athletes, starting the first day of preseason, all the way to the last day of school in June. No exceptions, nothing else, and today I actually had the ninth and 10th graders repeat that in a mantra. It covers everything, first day of school to the last day of school. And what if I haven't yet signed the contract? And this is one that I think the school board, as we, as you, if you choose to go ahead and look at the policy, is the significance of that contract is much in, misinterpreted by, un, misunderstood by our students. Because the myth is, if you haven't signed the contract yet, um, that you haven't violated the policy. And the reality is, signing the contract doesn't matter. In fact, there is no contract. We never ask the kids to sign a contract about substance use, because the policy is in, is in effect from the first day of school to the last. There is an acknowledgement of rules form that kids are asked to sign, but even if they don't sign it yet, the rules still apply, the policy still applies to them. And that can, can, that can get confusion for students. What I explain to kids is the purpose of asking them to sign the rules is to encourage, to make sure that the conversation is happening between the coaches, the advisors, and the kids. What about the period between seasons? And by this time, the students got, after we were talking to them for a while, that it's irrelevant that it's between seasons because it covers from the first day of school to the last day of school, and that includes the, the period between seasons, um, so that still applies. So there are certain types of activities um, that if a student, um, either on school grounds or off school grounds, is involved in violating a the policy, these are, the, these are the covered activities. And basically, it's any performance covered or leadership group. Okay, if you're on student government, you're on the jazz band, you're on theater, are you a performance, a competitive, or leadership group? There are certain activities that are not covered. For example, the volunteer club, um, the art club, some things like that. Uh, that don't involve performance, leadership, or competition, where students are essentially representing Cape Elizabeth High School. That's kind of the drawing line that the policy, as I understand it anyway, establishes. Now, here are the consequences. If you violate the policy on school grounds or at school events, the school board policy says there's an automatic four-day suspension from school that can be reduced to two if you agree to a couple of conditions to see the substance abuse counselor, which everybody agrees to, and to perform community service, which we did not well enforce in the last event, because, it, and I'm not gonna get into it, but we didn't well enforce that. We typically have, but we didn't this time. Um, and then there's an activity or an athletic consequence, 
and, those were, and there was a referral to the police. And under the policy, each of these things is mandatory once a violation is established on school grounds or at a school event. There's another level of consequence if you furnish or sell on school grounds or at a school event. There's an automatic 10-day suspension from school, there's an automatic referral to the substance abuse counselor, and there's an automatic referral to the police, and most likely if you sell at a school event or on school grounds, you're going to be charged with a felony, um, which is obviously a very serious thing. And then the other automatic uh, step is a referral to the superintendent for consideration of expulsion. What if no money changes hands? Is it still furnishing? Um, and since the policy specifically covers sales and furnishing, then presumably sales are different from furnishing. So the difference in my mind is one involves the exchange of money and one doesn't. So, so even if you just give, that's covered, that's considered furnishing. Okay, so the myth is it's not a sale if you're, unless money exchanges hand, you're not furnishing. Um, the reality is, even if you give drugs to another, and you're subject to those higher consequences. For events off school grounds, what happens? I'm not going to go through these details because they're really complicated and it depends which activities you're involved in. But there is an activities consequence that depends on the number of games, the number of events uh, for the first offense and then for the second offense. And there are, is a bigger consequence for the second offense. And beginning with the second offense, the consequence can carry over a school year. So if a student does something on the next to last day of school that violates the policy, the consequence carries into the next school year. And for the third offense, there's a loss of activities for the year. What if I self-refer? I'm going fast. I apologize. But I tried to keep it down to 15 minutes. Um, the key thing is, if this is, the, to me, the best provision of the policy, and I wish it were utilized more because it would be the greatest tool for parents in Cape Elizabeth if they would understand that if they self-referred for a violation of school grounds, there is no lost gains. There's a tremendously heightened reason for students who have gone through a first offense self-referral to say no. Because even though we say nothing, it's all confidential, the reality is it gets out into the community like wildfire, which is the very best thing in the world, because nobody can deny that that kid has a reason to say no the next time. And subsequent offenses are affected by whether or not there was a first self-referral. Um, now, there is a myth about self-referral, and the myth is that I can wait to refer myself to either to Troy Henninger or to me until just before you're about to get caught. <laughs> and students always know when we're looking into events, um, because we call them in to our offices in the room and mill, no matter, what we, no matter what we don't say, which is nothing, it's out there. Um, and so sometimes it used to be until the latest revision of the policy that kids would come up literally as they knew we were looking for them, even though this event was four weeks ago. The reality is, in the latest iteration of the policy, there's a definition of self-referral that requires that the referral happen within 48 hours after the event takes place. Consequences for tobacco. Um, tobacco violations. All the consequences are the same except the extra severe penalties for furnishing and sales don't apply. In other words, if you give cigarettes to another on school grounds, you, are, you have violated the policy for being in possession and you're handled as one who's been in possession. But the elevated 10-day suspension, referral to the police and all that, that does not apply. Are there adults in the building I can talk to safely without fear of consequence? The answer is yes. And we've, they've been in the assemblies and the presentations and, and they've identified themselves to kids. And the answer is in the vast majority of cases, kids can go to a guidance counselor. They can go to Joyce Nader, our substance abuse counselor. They can go to our school nurse. And under those people's certificates and liabilities and laws, they must keep information confidential. And they do. They will not tell us about unless the only exception, and it's a rare and virtually non-existent exception, is if there's a real concern about imminent safety threat. For example, a student comes to the, to the substance abuse counselor's office. I don't believe this has ever happened in the 12 years I've been in high school, but hypothetically, and the student is just rip-roaring drunk. That presents, now this counselor can take care of that child by calling the parent and make sure the parent gets home unless obviously the kid is so drunk that they have to go to the hospital and then it becomes a public event. But the other fear is that if there is one student who is in that condition, there may be another. 
So there is an obligation to sort of follow up, and at some point in those rare cases, which again, I don't think has happened in 12 years, um, there may be an, an obligation to, um, to bring in administrators. Um, what happens if I have violation in one year and, the, and, the, and another in a later year? Each year there is a clean slate. Consequences can carry over from previous years. But in terms of the offenses, you can start off the following year, you can self-refer, you can go through a first offense, second offense, third offense, there's a, there's a clean slate each year. Um, here are some, from this, these are my editorial thoughts about, as, especially as I reflect on the most recent events, uh, policy issues to consider that I know some people have been talking about is the tobacco consequence, whether it should be what it is. Clarification of the furnishing, I think I've talked about that. Self-referral is 48 hours enough. Um, and the mixed messages of the contract. Okay, since that event took place, I have been meeting um, with a group of counselors. Um, Andrea is part of it, the guidance counselor, substance abuse counselor, uh, Troy Henninger, and others to th think about, okay, how can we turn what happened into a positive learning experience for kids? So we are starting to do that. Um, so the, the Aftermath Committee has been meeting to plan a series of events. Um, we were supposed to make final decisions on the snow day, but Meredith called school. I can't imagine why. You're welcome. So we have, <laughs> so we have some events that we still have to finalize. So I'm not going to give you the entire list because there's still some uncertainty about some, but there's some that we've already started on. Um, we met with the kids. Um, there definitely will be a session in early March, late February, early March. We're trying to work out dates uh, with Detective Fenton and, and Officer Dorval and the juvenile case corrections officer is going to come and talk to our kids um, about the legal system and how that works. Um, there is likely going to be an information discussion session about the effects of drug use on athletic and academic performance. This one will involve more of a discussion. What we gave them the other days have really been delivering some information. Um, and that's what it was, but there's other things that are going to require more discussion. Um, we are considering possible sessions on addiction and recovery. Uh, which I think will be fascinating. Um, we are considering, and is likely, I would say, a session on drug use's impact on others and social media issues. We touched on that a little bit. Um, we're talk we plan on having counterpart sessions of all the things we do for parents. We'll probably lump them together a little bit. Um, we're going to be looking at bystander responsibilities. The events we've planned are not just this year, because our feeling is we don't want to do a uh, week-long, two-week-long, boof, every day something about substances. Kids will absolutely turn us off. Um, so we want to do a little bit at a time, keep the conversation going, keep planting the seeds, and so far we're up to about um, November 2013. Hi, Mr. Shadd, sorry to interrupt, I have a question. Um, all of those, are those going to be like during the day for students, like assemblies, all grades? Okay. That's our plan. Again, some of them are not definite, Abby, yes. Okay, just like in... Mostly around the achievement period, but some days we will expand the achievement period when there are issues that require more discussion. Short classes? <laughs> 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 You're in trouble. Yes, they would have to be. Okay. Yes, they would have to be. Okay, there are a couple of groups who are looking at bigger cultural issues, mm -hmm. making sure each student has a significant adult relationship, a committee that's actively looking at that, breaking down barriers among students, and healthy versus unhealthy competition. I have raced through this and not provided a lot of time for questions. Our thought was, what I explained to these folks, is we'll do, do presentations, and then I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards, and I hope I apologize that things got extended because of my technological snafu. So, okay. so would you like us to hold questions then until after this? If that, if, would that be okay? Okay, okay sure, that's okay. fine. This is Joyce Nato. I will say that this is her first year at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, it's not my first year working with her when I was at Mount Ararat for a couple of years. Um, she was the substance abuse counselor at Mount Ararat, um, and she has certainly gotten to know a lot of kids very quickly at Cape Elizabeth High School. So, Joyce. I'm just going to talk about what it is I do once a student is referred to me. <coughs> Um, because they're required to see me for six sessions if they're referred because of an event, an incident. If a student just comes into my office, that's really up to them how many times they see, see me. But in these cases, it's six sessions. Um, and it can be a quick six weeks, but I actually like it when they can't make it one of those weeks because I like to extend it out as long as possible to keep the conversation going with them. Um, 
And sometimes with more time, they have more incidences that they can bring in to discuss, things that happen on the weekend. So I'm, we're really getting into what their lifestyle is like, and that's helpful. In any case, the first session is about the event, how they see themselves in that event, what they see as their responsibility for that event, and who else they think is responsible. Um, I never do anything with the information they give me about someone else, but this is just to get me a give me a sense of what is their motivation to change. I need to know what their motivation is, because that guides what I do next with them. The next four sessions, I cover a series of things, maybe not in this exact order, but these are the things that I address. Um, whether they know of any family history of addiction, whether they know of any family history of mental illness, because those two are connected, um, not always, but we do know now that there's a very clear connection between some mental health disorders and use. Um, also, what their exposure to substances has been. Not, in addition to what they've used, but have they been around members of the community who have used? Um, at what age did that exposure start? When did they stop being afraid of drugs and be curious about drugs? That makes a difference to what we do next as well, because that tells me how long have they had this relationship. The next one is, um, obviously education about substances. And we talk about those substances that they've used, substances they've heard about. Oftentimes students will bring in names of things because they don't know what it is, but they've heard about it. And they, they've even said, I've been in a situation where this has come up and I, I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was talking about. And so there's a real fear about, it, about identity. So we talk about um, their identity in that relationship and their understanding of substances. Um, and in that education piece is also, what do substances do to you? And there's always current research on the effects of substance use. So I try to always keep up with one or two current articles that we can read and discuss. Um, and that's been very helpful. The last piece is a relapse prevention plan. Relapse prevention means, what are you going to do to not do this drug or these substances again? And I base it on their goal. Now, it would be wonderful if every student who saw me had a goal of never using again. That would be beautiful. That doesn't happen very often. So most students, I require they establish a goal. Is your goal not to use the rest of this school year? Is your goal not to use until the end of the summer? Is your goal not to use for the rest of your high school career? Because it has to be a goal that they're invested in, and that's why they establish that goal. And with that, we then go through who within your peer group could support that goal? Who within your family are you comfortable sharing that goal with? Who within the community would you like to know, have them know about this goal? Because when students don't think about their relapse prevention, they are at a much greater risk to do it again without thinking. The thing I hear the most is students say, I'll say, we're doing a relapse prevention plan, and they'll say, I've never thought about this. This is not how it happens. I said, that's right. This is how relapse prevention happens. The way you've been functioning is how use happens. So though that last piece sometimes takes two sessions, and I keep that plan. I keep it in a folder, and sometimes I see those kids again. And I pull out that plan and say, OK, are we still on this plan? Is the goal different? Where are we going from here? So that's what the six sessions are. Any student can see me more than that. Um, they just can't see me less. Thanks. Thank you. And next are Julie Ewald and Cindy Garfield, who are uh, the leaders of HOPE, uh, which has been the partnership organization between school and police and parents and community. Uh, to try to, as I said before, open up the conversation. So they're going to talk a little bit about the work of HOPE. Thank you. I'm Julie Ewald, and Cindy Garfield is going to be handing out some information for you. HOPE stands for Healthy Outreach for Prevention and Education. It's a community action team that was formed in Cape Elizabeth around 2008, following a high school panel discussion and presentation on prescription drug abuse. The mission is to encourage adults and youth to create an open dialogue in order to build the strength, knowledge, and community support necessary to make positive and healthy choices. HOPE's goal is to keep our youth safe by promoting safety, health, and well-being. 
Some statistics indicate that one in seven people will face addiction problems at some point in their life. One in seven. So that would mean out of a class of 140 students, which is about the number in our junior class, that 20 would cope with addiction in the future. Hope recognizes that substance abuse is not the core of the problem. Substance abuse is really a symptom of a mosaic of problems and circumstances which challenge our community today. Other symptoms include other addictions, eating disorders, self-injurious behaviors, social aggression, and bullying. The most comprehensive solution to this challenge is to proactively address wellness overall, not only in the individual, but in the community as a whole. At first glance, the challenge may seem overwhelming, but the good news is that when we nurture wellness, we not only address the core issues behind the symptom of substance abuse, but there is potential to impact all of these other potential symptoms as well. Some of the major components of this mosaic that HOPE has become aware of through education, research, and insight are stress. It is the number one reason why teens try drugs is to handle school-related pressures, whether they be social, academic, or surprisingly athletic. Communication, outside influences of peers and media, the desire to engage in risk-taking behaviors during the teenage and young adult years, a sense of belonging and value in the community, and the powerful role of sparks in the life of youth. Hope recognizes that to address these challenges today, the following things need to happen. We need to provide youth with coping and stress management skills. We also need to encourage development of an innate sense of strength when faced with challenges, and this is called resiliency. We need to encourage dialogue between all members of the community, including parents, youth, school personnel, law enforcement, faith-based organizations, and businesses. We need to empower parents with the knowledge that their attitudes and communication through role modeling and messages have more influence than peer pressure and media. We also need to empower teens and parents to back each other up when faced with difficult decisions involving substance abuse and other unsafe behaviors. We need to provide youth with safer ways to take chances, satisfy their curiosity, their zest for adventure and discovery, and take a longer look at the, the reasoning process in teens. We need to facilitate establishment of more connections between teens and the community through programs like mentoring. Research shows that teens who feel valued by their community, have relationships with other adults from various backgrounds in the community, are less likely to engage in risky behaviors. We need to promote youth's identification and engagement in interests and activities that are important to them and that they feel passionate about so that they develop a sense of purpose and pride and are less likely to turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms. Over the past six years or so, HOPE has sponsored or participated in numerous community programs that support these tenets and aim to provide the community with tools. Some examples are in a list in front of you, um, one of them is Life of an Athlete by John Underwood. It was a series of presentations for students, coaches, and parents on the harmful effects of drugs on brain health and athletic performance. This program has further potential for implementation in high school for educating youth and adults about the value of character, integrity, and leadership along with health and high performance in athletics. In December of 2012, we had a community forum on the consequences of social hosting laws. There was a joint DEA and Cape Elizabeth Police Department presentation on bath salts. There was a marijuana presentation and discussion at last month's HOPE meeting. A panel discussion featuring a former CAPE student in recovery from substance abuse, which included multiple perspectives of his family members, law enforcement, his attorney, and his transition rehab counselor. Malcolm Gall from the Hyde School presented on college success guaranteed to last year's seniors in May, aimed at encouraging a smooth and healthy transition to college. We have Cape Appreciation Today, which brings together the community and youth in honoring the police and fire departments and other rescue personnel and volunteers. There is Cape Fusion, which is a supervised social venue for Cape Elizabeth High School students with activity selection guided by students involved who are called Cape Fusionaries. A stress reduction workshop was co-hosted with the High School Parent Association. We have the annual Red Ribbon Campaign, bringing awareness to safety during the holiday season. There's Camp Ketches Substance Abuse Awareness Presentations for parents of 7th and 8th graders. And there were presentations by the head of Mercy's Hospital Addiction Unit, Dr. Mark Publicker, on the scientific effects of marijuana 
and an evening with Maine Attorney General Stephen Rowe, which was a call to action on underage drinking. HOPE members also attend monthly meetings at Opportunity Alliance and serve on the steering committee for the Rivers Region Substance Abuse Coalition, which aims to reduce teen alcohol and drug use in the towns of Cape Elizabeth, Gorham, Scarborough, South Portland, and Westbrook. One of the most effective programs that HOPE has supported are the parent meetups we sponsor. Parents who attend will learn about new information and trends in underage substance abuse and drinking and have an opportunity to connect with other parents in a judgment-free zone. With the help of a trained facilitator, they share challenges and ideas for preventing unhealthy behaviors in youth. Many parents find that our meetups are extremely efficient use of their time in an era where time is a precious commodity. In one and a half hours, they can establish a connection with other parents of their child's peers and engage in discussions that otherwise may have taken years to occur. During childhood, and especially the teenage years, there are so many changes that occur. When there is a void, an absence, a transition, there's an opportunity for either positive or negative change to happen. It's a tricky time for parents who struggle walking the thin line between respectfully allowing their children to explore their independence and simultaneously maintaining a meaningful connection with them. While the recent event at the high school is disappointing, we can also look at it as an opportunity. We can get beyond the impulse to merely put a band-aid on the problem by just addressing the symptoms and instead choose to work on what's at the core. There is a need for a comprehensive and proactive approach that addresses a mosaic of problems and circumstances, as I've discussed, in the kindergarten through 12th grade age groups, while incorporating the goals from the Cape Elizabeth School District's new mission statement. Community, action, passion, and ethics. Over the years, HOPE Action Team has discussed various programs with potential for application in Cape Elizabeth, and we keep returning to one program. The Search Institute has a program based on 40 developmental assets, which are values and experiences that help young people thrive and become healthy, caring, and responsible adults. I've provided you with copies of specific information on the um, developmental assets in that packet. As we progress through this paradigm shift in redefining the meaning of success from external achievements to include an inward focus on well-being, happiness, and character, it's essential to examine the building blocks we really need. Researchers from the Search Institute looked at 24 high-risk behaviors and found that young people with 31 or more of the 40 assets, or building blocks, tend to get involved minimally in high-risk behaviors, whereas those with fewer than 10 assets or building blocks were likely to get involved with 10 of the risky behaviors. HOPE would like to support Cape Elizabeth School District in bringing more knowledge and support to our community regarding the choice of wellness over unhealthy options such as substance abuse. We can assist with research and education, we can help provide outlets for information, and serve as a link to various sectors of our community. HOPE usually meets the second Thursday of the month at the high school library from 7 to 8.30. There's usually announcements in the high school bulletin about when we meet and any changes. We would like to encourage you to attend our meetings. We really appreciate those of you who we know have been attending our meetings. We value the school board's perspective and hope to see you at one of our meetings. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of material, so thank you all. Well, <laughs> oh, we've got Andrea, okay. Just playing my role as MC for the last person, um, Andrea Kerr, who needs no introduction, health <laughs> teacher at the high school. This is kind of germane to what I'm going to say. I didn't plan to really do this, but um, we just share this. This is information you already have, but I realized quite a bit people are going to think about it. So I decided to hand it over. Thanks, Andrea. I guess the person who's been here the longest gets to talk last. <laughs> okay, um, I have been asked by Jeff to uh, talk about the ninth grade health curriculum, uh, health forum, and also some reflections. I'll try to keep the emphasis on the curriculum, but I have a lot of reflections. I'll try to be very brief. It's 20 past. I'll see how fast I can talk. So here goes. I'm really representing Heather Kennedy in the elementary school, Scott Labby in the middle school, and uh, Scott Shea and myself in the high school as our system-wide health educators. Um, when 
when we have an opportunity to look at what you see in front of you for ninth grade for the required health course in the high school, the reason I thought it was important to pass that out to you is to let you know that we meet about 55 times to achieve all that. And it's really important when we start thinking about things like substance abuse and how much time we have to do those kind of programs. When I was talking with Scott Labby, he meets students 27 times approximately each year to do all of his curriculum work. So I think it's really important and it helps us kind of get a sense of the minimal time that we have to do such, something that's so important. Um, when ninth graders come into health class and we get to the point when we t start talking about substance abuse, one of the ways I often start is I said, tell me everything you know. Because the more you tell me, then I know what I need to do. And so I want to hear all kinds of great things. And you know, and then I think about their limited experience in the middle school and their development and how sometimes they're absent or they're just not paying attention or it's not a part of their life or they're not touched by it and all those kind of factors. And every single time I ask them to do that, I'm, I'm waiting and I'm, I'm waiting and I'm excited. And I hear about five or six things and then the conversation stops. So it's a reminder that even though they think they know everything, and it's so involved in the, the culture around them and conversations around the dinner table and all those kind of things that are really important. When it comes right down to it, it's really about this kills brain cells and it might cause addiction. And beyond that, there's not a lot that's brought to the table in the beginning. So it just reminds us about how much work we have to do. With Scott, Shay, and I in particular, we deliver at the high school the required course. Um, our feeling is similar. We come from a point of view of lifestyle health choices. It's not so much about no's, don'ts, can'ts, and shouldn'ts, but rather about the benefit that we derive from living a healthy life day to day immediately. So it's not, well, if I, if I don't drink, if I don't use drugs now, then you know, maybe I won't have an addiction, but rather, how am I going to feel today? Or how am I going to feel about myself? Or how am I going to, how, how's my health going to be? Am I going to be sleeping? Am I going to be eating well? And all those kind of things. So we really try to come from that point of view, much more so than here are all the drug categories and these are all the specific things. Now there's a place for that, for sure. But in the limited time that we have, we have to make some important decisions. So we're taking a look at a lot of these kids who still haven't had a lot of experience, and some of them none at all. And they'll often say to me, you know, Miss Care, all that stuff we talked about in freshman year and I was thinking like really that's not going to happen to me they see me in the hallway sophomore year and say you know everything we talked about is something that I have been in the environment of or in the presence of or needed to make a decision myself so there's sort of this disconnect you know because of their developmental stages and all that so we stress decision making in everything we do we stress it in the context of goal setting and personal responsibility we talk about it in the sense of family we talk about it in the sense of family values um, we talk about it in um, the impact that our decisions have on ourselves on our family members and on our community um, the, the age range that really gets that is the juniors and seniors who are in the elective health forum class. That's when it, it's an aha moment. I get that. And so freshmen will try to get it, and some do, but primarily juniors and seniors in health forum get that, that my actions really impact my community, impact myself, impact my family, et cetera. Um, we also try to help them redefine what peer pressure is, and I think that it's important for adults to do the same. When teenagers think that we have um, an attitude that there's sort of this pressure, and I think these guys could um, speak to that far better than I can, of sort of like people standing over you. There was even a commercial years ago where people would stand right over you sort of and say, do this, or you won't be my friend, or whatever, but rather it really is peer influence. It's what our friends are choosing to do and how we want to be involved no matter what the decision might be. And the opposite choice is often loneliness. Our, our non-substance users, as they make their way through high school, often feel lonely. They can't seem to find one another, even though there are more people out there that are not using. And part of that is because the decision to not use is a very private one. It's hardly ever a cause. And so if we were to look around at teenagers in the high school, we're not going to find kids who are going to make it a cause, but rather it's a really deep personal conviction that they are practicing. Um, I just had an interesting thing happen in the first semester. A student, and I wrote it down because I wanted to be able to share this with you. A student at the very first day of uh, substance abuse education in health form, so this was juniors and seniors, a senior went to the board, didn't say a word, I hadn't started yet, and he wrote down the following quote, your body is a temple. When you use substances, you scratch the marble. 
And I thought, wow, he set this tone. It was an amazing tone that he set for the rest of the time that we worked. And then at the very end of our work, I had students write some reflections about their thoughts, their experience, et cetera. I had three students actually write the quote down and say, volunteer, offer, that I am making a similar choice. Um, this is very exciting to health educators to hear students in their writing privately say, that's a choice that I'm making, it's a private one, I don't go out and promote it, I don't judge people who are making a different choice. And so I think we, it reminds us how we have to meet everybody at their level, the best of the ability that we can. Another thing I think that's really important and that I, we try to stress um, in our health classes is that we really are not going real aggressively with the whole idea around cognitive development and brain development with our teenagers because we're very careful about not giving them permission to try to do the right thing. If they hear consistently from adults, we feel, and we could be wrong on this, and something is a conversation Joyce and I really need to have, um, is that if we, if we continually tell them about the new information, I think adults need to talk about that. But if we give that information to students and we're not careful how we do it, I think the fallout from that, based on years and years of working with teenagers, is this. It gives me permission to use, and I can just simply say that my brain isn't developed and I can't cognitively make those decisions and I'm a risk taker teenager. So I think it's a very very subtle kind of thing that we have to think about. Um, I also, um, so, so primarily um, when I ask students a couple other things that I'd like the school board to think about and, and, and I'd, I'd like the school to find a way to do some work around this is that if you ask students um, about conversations that their families have had any around uh, family history, it's more rare that people say yes. If you ask a student, have you had a conversation with your parent about, especially ninth graders, if, have, have you had a conversation with your parents, have they brought it up what you should do if you're in an awkward or a compromising situation? Most often the answer is no. Now it may be that it's true and they just don't feel comfortable saying no and you know saying yes in the classroom it's hard to know. So I think those are some interesting things that we need to continue to work on as invested parents and adults in the community. Um, I also am surprised to hear a number of students say if I say to them you're a freshman now and if somebody comes up to pick you up in the front of your house do, do, do they have to come to the door and there are a lot of freshman students who say no that's not necessary it's not necessary that my parents know who's the driver, et cetera, and others will say, oh, absolutely. So I think there's some really interesting things that are happening in the community. Also, um, one of the things that I want to leave you with, it's a reflection more than anything, is that um, when you ask students about all of this, they'll often say it's a mother's thing. This is a mother's worry. My mother might bring it up. These Cape moms have got nothing better to do than to have meetings and talk about this stuff. So whenever I have an opportunity, whenever I have an opportunity, I always say, we have to get our men and our dads on board. We have to um, present a united front. I myself did not have that benefit. I raised three teenagers myself, fully, completely by myself. The number of times at night that I just held my breath, no cell phones at the time, so you couldn't check in. Um, so I know what it feels like to do it alone. And so wherever it is possible, if there are two adults in the family where they can work together to establish the limits and the boundaries and have a conversation, those are some of the things that I've come away with in all the years that I've been working. Um, also, I think that our dads um, have a lot to bring to the table. And I know that sometimes both parents can't attend events or whatever. So um, I think we need to show that men care and that they have expectations too. The um, health forum class can get into more of the progression of the disease. One of the things that surprises me is that they'll often say, well, I think that either somebody has a problem with it or they don't. They don't see the progression. They don't see the, the, the journey into the disease part of it. So I help them with that. We look at the uh, family dysfunction and family roles within, uh, within the uh, family. Um, and aside from that, I mean, there's lots of things that I could say. It's been a long night. I don't want to, I'm trying to condense it as, fast, you know, as much as I can. Um, you know, I would love to work with these kids every year because of the development and their readiness to learn. And also when, when people, all of us, have had personal experiences about anything, then we come to the table wanting to know more. 
It's like if somebody gets a diagnosis of cancer, that's what we, that's what we want to investigate. We want to learn more about it. So the most, uh, the, the students who listen the, the most and probably learn the most really are those students who have been touched by substance abuse themselves in their family, extended family, close friends, because they're ready to listen and to learn. So there's lots more I could say, but I'll leave it at that. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Andrea. So, um, do, does the board have questions? Mary? One quick question, and, and lots of thank yous, actually. This was a tremendous presentation. I learned a lot, um, and I appreciate how much is being done in the high school uh, to uh, look at substance abuse for our kids. I'm not surprised to see that those numbers have gone down, given um, how much conversation is out there. And thank you um, for all the work you do with all of our students. And, um, Jeff, one quick question. You, when we talk about the policy, and I think we'll revisit the policy, and I appreciate all of your, um, your thoughts around what we should revisit. Um, one of the parts uh, that I wanted to uh, look at, and we'll, talk, we'll do this in policy and not here, is the community service aspect. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for kids to perform community service for a lot of reasons. Um, and you mentioned that the kids in December, it, it was just, I'm sure, um, an onerous task at that point to, to um, you know, to, to find places to place kids. Will that, will there be a follow-up? Will you loop back around with those students? We will. Um, we'll have that opportunity to yes. perform that service. Yes, it may look a little bit different. In the past, typically, you know, when we have smaller events, uh, we have contacts at the soup kitchen, um, and we used to send kids to the police station to clean vehicles and things like that, but honestly, they began, began to be a little bit overwhelmed, and when you have an event of the magnitude that we have had, um, sending X number of kids to the soup kitchen becomes a challenge. So we recognize that's a check box that hasn't been completely checked off yet, so absolutely, we will circle back to that. One of the, one of the pieces of community service to me which would be most meaningful uh, around this is, and I, I, I take some leadership from Joyce in this because she has conversations with kids and she will never share details with me, but one of the questions I, I, I'm going to be asking her in a few weeks is, it, it, would it be appropriate to have that group of kids or some subsection of the group of kids to come in? And this is a form of community service that would be invaluable to meet with me, to meet with perhaps Mary, uh, Meredith, and maybe Andrea and a few adults, and say, "Teach us," you know, a little bit to the extent. And some of those kids, I think, will be willing to do that, and some it may look a little bit different. But we know we need to check that box off. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Other question? I would just like to say I really appreciate. First of all, all of the work that Hope has been doing for the past six years, you guys are incredible, the persistence that you've given this. Um, I know from the folks in the prevention field that they admire the work that you do throughout the entire region. You're often held up as an example. So thank you for all of that. Um, and then, Jeff, I also really appreciate the overview that you've given with the policy. Um, we will, I think, be revisiting the policy in our policy review of the entire manual, <coughs> either um, well, I think before next November at the very least, and having community conversations around that and your input, as well as the input of Hope and, and Andrea and, mm -hmm. of course, NATO. Joyce. Joyce. I get confused. Right. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> okay, as long as you guys know, you're all set. Um, will be invaluable to that conversation, as well as the conversation having that with building administrators and parents and communities and students as well. It will be very important to um, dig down in, pull up, roll up our sleeves and find out what's working, what's not working, and where we can make improvements on the policy. So thank you for that. Um, and Andrea, I just want to say thank you for taking care of our children for us. You do an amazing yeah. job. The mama. <laughs> <laughs> Other, 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 David? Um, I, ha I have a lot of questions, but I think it's better 
for the policy committee, I, I just want to give a slightly different perspective. It's very hard to craft a policy that's not overreaching and not underreaching. Mm -hmm. uh, even the word furnish that Jeff used, I can think of instances that would shock you that would fit in the word furnish. There's actually a word that I pointed out to Jeff in our things that says transport, which kind of stunned us that was in there. And that means if you're in a car and somebody has some pot in a backpack you don't know about. So it, it's really hard to craft something that gets at what you want in, in a fair and reasonable way. And then on the other side, um, if I may slightly disagree with you, is that kids, especially males, frontal cortex lobe is not fully developed until they're 25. So if we flog every kid that makes a mistake from the time they're a freshman until they're a senior, I'm not sure how much they're going to, at some point the punishment becomes self-defeating as opposed to a learning experience and a prevention experience. So I just want to say it's a hard balance to craft and policy is only going to do so much. The real answer is going to be in what all these people do as opposed to what we do in terms of policy. So I just felt like saying that. Well, I, well, I, th I think that when the policy committee takes a closer look at this, I suspect that you, you will be looking for ways to, um, to hear input from all the experts we have in the, in the system and in the community and at HOPE and from students. Um, and, and what I've heard from members of the board is, as we've talked about this, this issue is that you use the word punishment, but that's the first time we've heard that word tonight. We, we, what I've heard from members of the board is about how to um, construct consequences which um, keep kids engaged um, and which create learning experiences which help them create or help them to make healthier decisions uh, going forward. So, uh, Joe. Oh, I just wanted to add to that is um, there's also an accountability aspect. Um, it's a it's a mistake, um, and it doesn't need to be a, a level of consequence that is so severe that it diminishes someone's prospects, but instead that there's an accountability and a reflection on how those mistakes could diminish your potential prospects. When you're looking at substance abuse in teenagers, um, those who use by the age of 15 are five times more likely to become an adult with an alcohol or drug use disorder. And I see Ms. Nato nodding to the statistics. And those are very real consequences that we want to prevent our youth from having to face as adults. And that I also wanted to say that substance abuse is a very multifaceted issue. It has um, a, a multi-root issue in the problem of, of how it presents itself and that a policy is only one very tiny sliver in how you address substance abuse in youth in the community. But it is a certain um, sliver that is within the power of a school board to look at. So I think that that, in that respect, is a very important thing for us to do. So. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else? <clears throat> um, yeah, I agree. I think uh, as a school board, many times, the view is, you know, the school board will make the policy and, and that's where our obligation finishes. And I feel that given uh, the percentage of students that are being impacted by this and by the percentage of families that are being impacted, I think although uh, the school board may not have all the answers, it's our obligation to continue to ask the question. And one thing I hear continually is, you know, this is a difficult conversation for the community to have. And I see no better group than the school board who were elected by these communities to continue to, to, to say, you know, this is an issue. We don't have all the answers, but we'll keep it in, in, in front, um, you know, be more, more than policy. Continue to ask, well, what are we doing? And not to put anyone on the defensive, but say, you know, we realize this is challenging. And I think one of the best things the school board can do is to continue to ask questions. and. Uh, the test will be a year from now. Are we still talking about this? And if we're not, I think the community will say, well, either we've resolved it 
which it's unlikely we will. So I encourage mm -hmm. um, us to continue to ask questions and look for opportunities to make it easier for parents to, to have these discussions. Did you have, okay. Andrea and Joyce, and I know Hope um, as well, can parents call, what's the best um, process if parents have questions <coughs> that um, they have an immediate <clears throat> feeling or red flag and that they would like to call other one of us. I mean, sometimes they call me directly, sometimes they call Andrea to see if I'm okay and she passed them on to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So, but I think you both get calls. And you, it, it's great for parents to call. Yes. Um, and again, it's, it's a lot of times parents lining up, kids are safe lining up on the same page. So you appreciate that, those phone calls? Or um, Jeff, I would you say that? I appreciate phone calls of parents of students who I've met with when the student goes home and says, Ms. Netta certainly thinks that pot is not harming me. Um, so I like that call. Because they don't want their parent to have an ally in this battle against their use. So it, since they know I can't share their information with their parent, but I can certainly say to a parent, let me tell you what my position is. So you can go back and discuss that with your child. So I really like that call. I get that one. Well, I've worked in other schools, but I've had that one more than once. Here's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about I can get that type of phone call or a parent in because I'm a health educator and I brought up something that triggered something, whatever. And I can say now, not only do we have a social worker who's wonderful, but we have a social worker who has a degree in, um, in substance abuse counseling. This is tremendous for our school. And um, I'm happy that Joyce is on board. It's made all the difference. Um, so I look for very good things ahead. I bet Troy likes um, that you're here as well. <laughs> we all do, but we don't want it to go to her head yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> other, are there any other questions? I would just um, add, I, I want to put in a plug for, for Hope, and uh, particularly as a father, since that issue came up. Um, I, I've been to a number of Hope meetings. Um, I would encourage um, dads in Cape Elizabeth to, to attend those meetings, um, or one, one of those, choose one and go. Um, they're invariably uh, fascinating um, discussions, and you, I guarantee you will learn something. Um, and if you have kids in, in middle school or high school, you, you'll probably find it particularly relevant. Um, so I, and the other thing I would say is that um, if you, if Hope could keep the school board informed of when your meetings are, we have an email address, um, and we'd, uh, we should be able to keep track, but we're better if we're, <laughs> if we're reminded. So if you put us on your list so we know when the meetings are, I, I think school board members are, are concerned about this issue and paying a lot of attention and, and would have a lot of stand a benefit from attending your meeting. So th I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. OK. Um, moving on to item 5D, retirements and resignations. Meredith. Um, so we, receive, we have received um, three notices of retirement and resignation um, to date. And um, under the teacher's contract, they're um, requested to notify the district by February 15th of those plans. So uh, I'd like to just announce the, um, Joyce Bell, our high school librarian, <coughs> Paula Harris, our nurse at Pond Cove, and Susan Michaud, fourth grade teacher at Pond Cove, um, have given us those notices. And I can segue right into item E if you're ready. OK. And I'll try to do this in record time. Um, superintendent's report. Um, Chairman Christie will be asking for school board appointments to two newly formed town council committees. Uh, we hope to make those appointments at the March business meeting. Those are the library planning committee and the town center planning committee. We've received um, notice from Tara Bucci, who's been on a leave of absence from the district, that she'll be returning um, to Pond Cove in the fall. 
We have four high school students who have been selected as candidates for the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program, and they are Cameron Caswell, Daniel Epstein, Robert Fichero, and Matthew Gilman. So congratulations mm -hmm. to those young people and their families and teachers. I have several Scholastic Writing Awards to announce. We have, of the five uh, Gold Key American Voices nominees in the state of Maine, two of them are Cape Elizabeth students. One is Lily Jordan, um, and her teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School is Lauren Tarantino, and the other is Jane Vaughn, and her teacher is Lisa Melanson. A Gold Key Award winner, Abigail Berman. Lisa Melanson is also her teacher. Silver Key winners, we have uh, three students who received four awards, and those students are Ian Andelsek, uh, Natalie Gale, and Ben Stanley, who received two awards. And then uh, we have four students who received five honorable mention awards. And those students are Natalie Gale, whose teacher is Allison Hawks, I neglected to mention that, Caitlin O'Sullivan, whose English teacher is Sarah Steiner, William Steidel, Steidel or Steidel? Steidel. Got it right the first time. Uh, whose teacher is Lisa Melanson and Jane Vaughn again. So congratulations to those young people. It's quite an honor to be selected for that award. We have a Pond Cove student, Oliver Wilson Bosworth, whose art will be on display at the Portland Museum of Art during Youth Art Month between March 1st and 31st. And there will be a reception on Saturday, March 2nd from 4 to 7.30 at which he and the other students whose art pieces were selected will be honored. Uh, on the professional development front, last Thursday, the night before the snowstorm, uh, Linda Reef, who is a middle-level educator and um, has written a, um, a few books on um, working with teachers in the middle level on literacy, uh, spoke to about 25 teachers and administrators here. Um, her focus was, was on the use of a reader-writer notebook, but just encouraging students to use writing as a way of um, thinking and expressing their thoughts and responding to things that they read. And two weeks before that, we also had uh, Penny Kittle here. Penny, you may remember, worked for the district last year. Um, and again, there were about 25 folks who came out for dinner and gave up um, a week night evening to learn um, about how to better work with students around reading. Our Professional Monday book groups are continuing to share literacy practices and strategies. And I did hear an anecdote from one of the group facilitators um, this morning. They met uh, yesterday that, you know, one of the discussions in her group was, wow, this strategy seems so simple, but what an impact it had uh, in my classroom. So that was nice feedback. We are, um, the middle school principal search for next year has opened, so applications are due after vacation. We've received some responses from community members um, interested in participating on the interview committee. Budget. Uh, the overview presentation is scheduled for February 26th, and we are still awaiting some more detailed information from the state on the retirement cost shift. Um, we've received very little information other than the announcement in early January that we could expect um, a percentage of those costs to be transferred to the local district. Um, we're told perhaps we'll have some information on February 15th, but um, we have heard before that we would have information prior to vacation, so hopefully that will happen. We'll see. Um, school security, we are moving forward with the buzzer systems at Pond Cove in the middle school and expect those to be in place after vacation. As Nolan mentioned, there was a meeting at the high school which uh, Principal Shedd and I and Assistant Principal Henninger attended with a group of students to talk about specific plans at the high school and how to balance, um, you know, the issue that Nolan mentioned of sort of opportunities for students to leave campus and um, have some autonomy as um, young adults, but also to um, help the school environment be safe. Coming up May 6th through 11th, 2013, and this is only a working title, is Cape Celebrates Literacy Week. If you have better ideas, we're open to them. Uh, but CIF, um again, has given the district a, a generous grant to work um, on bringing that week together. And so far, we've confirmed uh, storyteller Len Cabral, author illustrator Scott Nash, children and young adult author Cynthia Lord, poet Paul Janesco, the Maine State Ballet's Page to Stage program, comedians, workshops, classroom visits, and uh, about 25 authors are confirmed for what we're calling Author Fest on Saturday, May 11th, um, an afternoon event where um, uh, we'll be, have some partnership from a uh, local bookstore, and we're also working on songwriters, musicians, reporters, TV personalities, outdoor educators, 
Uh, we're screening an HBO film on dyslexia and having a panel discussion. We're looking at social communication, and uh, the list goes on. If you have connections to people who um, display their literacy skills in any forum, let us know. We're still accepting ideas. We have great participation from each of our schools, our local library, preschoolers, our literacy consultant, uh, not preschoolers, they will have opportunities to participate in Literacy Week, but preschool programs in the community are participating in the development, so a lot going on, but mark your calendars. It's going to be an exciting week. It, is it outside the bounds of Literacy Week to suggest that people shop at Longfellow Books? Longfellow Books in Portland suffered a major damage related yeah. to the, the snowstorm where a window blew open, a pipe froze, and they lost a large portion of their collection. And, they're one of the rem few remaining bookstores of any kind in, in the Portland area. By local? So, are they open now? By local. They're open. They're, yeah. Are they, they open? They did reopen then? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Good for them. And they're, <clears throat> they're extremely supportive of schools and communities, not just in Portland, mm -hmm. but other preschools and um, refugee centers and other centers. They're an amazing bookstore. Yep. End of commercial break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, on to item, thank you, Meredith. On to item six, new business. 6A, consideration to approve Cape Elizabeth Paths budget. May I have a motion? I move that we can approve the Cape Elizabeth Paths budget, part one and two, budget costs for the 2013 2014 school year in the amount of 46600 and three dollars and ninety-five cents. Second. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? I have a question. Do you want to discuss? You discuss, and then see if it answers the question. I won't question. discuss, but I'll see. It. I'll, let me give this a stab. Um, so the paths budget is set by formula. That's part of the bylaws for the member districts of the paths group, Portland Area Technical High School, and it's a, it's based on an average of the two prior years' attendance. So our number of students who attended in the past two years is our contribution rate. So my question is, if I may. Um, what happens if we send, don't send enough students or we send too many students under or over that spread? It's adjusted in subsequent years. So we would see either a reduction if we send fewer students or an increase if we send additional students in subsequent past years. Oh, how clean. The, the number is declining. The, the, the last year or this year's number is much mm -hmm. lower than the year before is that a trend or is that just does it just fluctuate it just dips fluctuate. up and down okay any other questions all those in favor seven okay item 6b consideration to improve an unpaid leave request may i have a motion i move that we approve an unpaid leave request for the 2013-2014 school year for high school staff member, actually, is it a staff or a teacher? Does it matter? Um, Erica Blanche Roosley. Second. OK, any discussion? All those in favor? Seven. Um, item C, consideration of the following policy for second reading. I have a motion. Um, I move that we consider um, the policy BBAA board member authority for a second reading. Second. I'll second. You got somebody? I got somebody. Okay. Uh, any discussion? I, I, I have some discussion on that. Okay. Um, I just want to say that um, there are edits that uh, came out in our board packets. Um, and in the first sentence, there's yet an additional correction that needs to be noted. And I will read the policy as we are submitting for a second reading. Members of the board have authority only when acting as a board legally in session and 
the board shall not be bound in any way by any action or statement on the part of any individual board member, semicolon, provided, however, a member or members of the board shall have authority to act on behalf of the board when such authority has been delegated to such members by the board. And I apologize. So the first um, addition, the double underline, and or in an appointed capacity, um, we either did not receive or, or um, didn't see the additional corrections that were sent to us during the first reading period. And that um, corrected second reading, will that be posted? Or is this Typically, official? this is the vote for adoption. But if the board would like to defer that vote so that it has time to review the written language, that's, that's fine. Well, I guess then we defer to the chair. Do we want to adopt it as I've read with that addition, or do we want to send this back? Uh, can I weigh in? Sure. Please. I, I think her change is important for a variety of reasons, and I think the, the change that, that was made makes this a far more accurate um, uh, policy, and in fact, the change makes the one makes it consistent with what was discussed at the policy meeting. So I don't think it needs to go back. I mean, I'm glad to explain why I think it's a much better one, but I think which the, her, her changes make it work. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other? Can if, we move it, to adopt? <laughs> we already have a motion, so uh, what, I, what I'll do is if there's no other discussion, I'll, I'll just ask for votes. Well, as amended. As amended. Sure. So all those in favor of the motion as amended. Okay, seven. Thank you. Um, and so letter D, um, first reading. Joe, do you want to? Yes. Um, discussion. Now, is this a motion that you need for D? No. Okay. Um, there is a um, slate of policies that have been submitted for a first reading. Um, there is no vote required at this point. We are asking for those who wish to review these policies, if they have any comments or concerns, if you could please direct all feedback to either myself. Actually, if you could direct all your feedback to myself, Meredith, and Andrea Fuller, so that we all are on the same page by March 1st, so that we could consider your feedback by our next policy meeting, which is the first Monday in March. Um, I do want to point out, especially for our student representatives, that BBAB and BBABR student school board representative and the student school board representative guidelines do um, have a particular interest to you. And, and um, uh, at our policy meeting, we went through those guidelines and tried to um, sift through and what it would make it easier for you in order to become a representative to the school board. Um, on your behalf, but of course, um, your input on those changes are um, vital to us. Um, and there's also some changes that we put in there on the requirements of your service. Um, when the understanding of everything that a school board representative has to balance along with clubs, academics, and sports. Um, so the question I have for you is, in asking for feedback by March 1st, is that plausible and doable? I think that's doable. I yeah. think that's doable? In order for you to go back and Just review the changes and, and see if you accept? Is it, is it possible to view it? Is that what you're asking and like look at the? Is the timeline by March 1st? Oh, yeah, Does that give you enough time to review those changes and get back to us? Yeah. Okay. Where, where can we find them? In your packet. In the in your packet. Okay. And in the packet, yeah, we only have sheets. Okay. Yep. We'll get back to you. Awesome. Thank you. Is that it, Joe? That's all I have. Okay. Um, so on to letter E, consideration to approve a World Affairs Council trip. May I have a motion? make a motion. Right. Um, I move that we approve the proposed World Affairs Council National High School um, model um, United Nations trip to New York City, um, March 6th through the 9th, 2013. Second. Elizabeth. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. No? All those in favor? 
Seven. Okay. Uh, letter F. Consideration to approve athletics and co athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. May I have a motion? Okay. Elizabeth. Uh, I move we approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. May I just list them, say them as a slate, or should I read them? As listed in our packet, 6D, I uh, know, whoops, 6F, F. <laughs> um, for middle school and high school positions. Uh, a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Um, any discussion? All those in <laughs> All those in favor? Seven. Okay, letter G, consideration to adopt the 2013 school board goals. I'd like and to move that we adopt the 2013 school board goals. A second? <laughs> okay, Michael. Uh, would anybody be really willing to read the goals? I'm happy to read. Would you like yeah. me to read them? I sure. Have you have them right in front of you. Uh, yeah. Number one, sponsor a school budget that maintains vital programs and services. Develop and support a three to five year strategic plan for the district. That was number two. Number three, develop a five to ten year capital improvement plan in cooperation with the town council. Number four, develop a comprehensive plan to address substance abuse, including policy, climate, and cultural issues. Number five, complete the health insurance review process with the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. Number six, continue to explore district topics during workshops and business meetings, including school-to-school -school transitions, curriculum alignment school-to-school, -school, teacher administrator evaluations, and the student achievement gap. Number seven, complete the online district report card, including benchmarks to measure the district's performance. And number eight, complete the audit of the Cape Elizabeth School Policy Manual. Any discussion? Is everybody comfortable with our goals? I have a question. Yes. What happens if we don't complete the audit of the policy <laughs> manual? <laughs> I was there. Who was the one I and, you're, <laughs> and you have to be policy chair another, another year. <laughs> you get shot. All right. Our meetings are now three hours. <laughs> We're just skipping. Uh, you'll get finished, Joe. I'm, I have every confidence. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Seven. Thank you. Uh, letter H. May I have a motion? I move that um, we approve the Alpine ski trip to Black Mountain, Rumford, Maine, February 20th through 22nd, 2013. Mm -hmm. Second? I did. Yes, Okay. Um, any discussion? No? All those in favor? Seven. Okay. Item seven, committee reports. Michael, I, I think you have a report for? Sure. Um, this is part of, uh, I guess, the finance committee, and also we met there were several opportunities to meet with state legislators and I believe uh, the school board and the community will uh, initiate a dialogue on this and this is very important for not only the town of Cape Elizabeth but for all towns in Maine um, I'm sure tomorrow or maybe today you've read an article in the Cape Courier or maybe you were lucky enough uh, to visit the town website where the town manager in a press release uh, in coordination with uh, the superintendent NATO detailed the impact from the proposed uh, biennial budget on, on Cape Elizabeth. And one thing I would like to highlight is uh, even though this will impact Cape Elizabeth, it will impact all, all communities uh, throughout the state. Uh, to better understand the potential impact from the governor's proposed budget, members of the town council and school board have met with our state legislators on three separate occasions over the last month. We met with Senator Millett, who's chairing the education uh, committee in the Senate and is also on the appropriations committee, uh, Representative Monaghan Derrig, and we were also fortunate to meet with uh, Senator Justin Alfin, who's who is the uh, main Senate uh, leader. Uh, we were fortunate to have the opportunity to meet with them, and we were very thankful they could provide uh, or update us on, on the budget process. Um, 
The reality is that there are two components uh, of the governor's budget that will have a significant impact on, on schools and potentially taxpayers. One, uh, as we have uh, discussed in the past, was where uh, educational education funding will be curtailed. Uh, I think many of us may read that it's going to be flat funding from the state budget, uh, but actually that is after the curtailment. Another word for curtailment is cut. Um, so basically, uh, our funding from the state was cut 10% from what we budgeted at the beginning of the year was a mid-year cut. To put that in perspective, over the last five years, funding from the state has uh, declined approximately $1 million, or 40%. Uh, and as you know, our enrollment has been roughly flat to down 3 or 4% over that period. So just so everyone knows, when you hear flat funding, that's on an overall statewide basis. In reality, that may not mean flat funding for Cape Elizabeth. That may mean declining state revenues. So that's the first item on what flat funding really means for Maine communities. The second one is on teacher retirement. Uh, this is a cost that was a plan that was negotiated between the state and teachers. Um, we obviously support uh, our teachers and uh, the benefits that they uh, have earned. Um, so the issue really is the governor's proposal uh, target shifting these costs, these state costs that have been state costs since this was negotiated to local districts. And so I want to be very clear on this. Any dollar that is shifted from the state budget to the local budget would represent a new cost. What I mean is we never considered, not one school district considered this would happen. And the reason is, is that the state still hasn't met their own target of funding 50% of, educa of educational costs. So we never expected them to move in the opposite direction and shift more costs to local districts. It can be complicated, but very clearly, if even $1 is shifted from the state budget to the local budget, this would require for all main communities additional revenue, meaning tax increases, or further cost, cut cost cutting to what are already very uh, low costs that uh, many communities um, are facing. Uh, while we don't have an exact estimate for this potential impact from this cost shifting, the impact could be as high as $1.2 million. To put that in perspective, our entire budget increase, which covers uh, uh, over $20 million in budget, was uh, roughly $600,000. So this one line item cost shifting could be double what our entire budget e increase was last year on spending. Uh, as you know, the school budget, the school board will soon start the budget process as we emphasized in the goals that we just uh, were read for 2013, we'll continue to balance and maintain uh, a balance of maintaining and strengthening our educational programs against the finan financial climate for our citizens. Uh, so what could you do as a citizen? Given this is a state issue, I strongly encourage all citizens to contact Rebecca Millett, our, our Senator Millett, and Rebecca, uh, um, Representative Kim Monaghan Derrick, uh, ask them why this is good for Cape Elizabeth, why is this good for local communities, and also we would ask you to uh, be patient during the budget process. Although every year we deal with the uncertainty on state funding, it's particularly challenging this year. Uh, so we will continue to balance uh, the need to maintain and strengthen the programs against the overall financial climate. But I just wanted to lay that out for everyone. And if you have any questions on the particulars of what's being pro proposed, please contact your state legislators. If you have questions on the budget impact, I would encourage you to wait till I believe, it, what was it, February 26th to where the budget's presented to the school board. So apologize for that long um, interjection, but I think it's very important that the community understands what's happening and how it could impact all local communities in Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Could, could I add something to that? Rather than just contacting Senator uh, Millett and uh, Representative uh, Monahan Derrick, quite frankly, uh, there are a lot of Republicans and a lot of people in this town, and uh, Rebecca and Kim uh, are working hard to prevent this. But the reality is this is 
this is being caused in part by the fact that the, our governor cut taxes in the last session and is now trying to fund the, 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 that lost revenue by pushing costs down to us. And the person more, most likely to, that this, the Democrats are going to be, aren't going to be able to do this alone. And letters to the governor, to uh, Republican leaders would be just as effective, if not more effective, than contacting our people who are already opposing this. I just want to tell the public that. Thank you, David. Do, I, do we have other committee reports? I think so. Elizabeth? Uh, both the co-curricular steering committee and the um, athletic steering committees have met and uh, we will be, well, those administrators will be making their recommendations um, in the budget coming forward. So um, we can look forward to those details, but they were both productive meetings. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for your service to that committee. And are there other, is there another um, I can report just, or? No, just that our next policy committee meeting is uh, Monday, March 4th at 7.30 to 9 a.m. at the middle school library. Okay. And I would just reiterate that what Meredith said, that the town council created two new committees last night, one to look at the library issue and one to look at the town, the planning of the town center, um, and has, have, um, have, held open a seat on each of those committees for a school board member. So I will be looking for school board members interested in participating on one or both of those committees. Um, so um, that's- I volunteer Mary for the library committee. <laughs> um, that's probably something we'll, we'll be um, uh, appointing somebody to at our next meeting, but I, if, you're, if you're interested, please let me know before that. Can you just explain a little bit more what the I think the first one is pretty self-explanatory, but the second? The town, the town center planning committee. Um, what I can do is read to you the message that we got from Mike McGovern. Um, the second committee to be known as the town center plan committee 2013 is charged with taking a fresh look at the 1993 town center plan and its related zoning. The school grounds make up much of the town center zone and decisions involving abutting properties could also impact the schools. This committee will consist of nine members with the council having two of its members serve and the planning board and the school board are each being invited to appoint a member. In addition, five citizens will be chosen through the appointments committee process. The council designated David Sherman and Jamie Wagner to serve as the council's two representatives. John, could you explain um, that that was a good summary, but on a library committee, what is the composition of the library committee? Uh, the library committee is, I believe, is five members. The committee is to consist of five members, including three counselors and one library trustee, all chosen by the, the respective body. So it's three, three members of the town council, um, Frank Governelli, Kathy Ray, and Jessica Sullivan. Um, one library trustee chosen by the library trustees and one school board member. But no citizens? No. The, the, I, I, I attended and watched the town council meeting last night, and there was some discussion about the size of the committees. Um, and I, don't, I hope I can fairly characterize that, that discussion. They, they, the, the, town, the larger committee, the town planning committee, I think they felt that they wanted to have citizen representation, um, particularly citizens who either own businesses or lived in the town center. Uh, the, uh, but on the library committee, uh, the thinking, I think the predominant thinking was that a lot of, have, of study and work has already gone into that project and that there was not a need for as broad a representation on that committee. And I, I hope members of the town council will contact me if I've misrepresented their thinking on that. I, I was just more curious as to what the composition was without why they did it. That's their call. So right. you, you answered it. So if they call to complain, that's not what I was looking for. Just looking for the composition. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if, if, anyway. Uh, uh, number eight, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for future agendas, agenda items? No? Okay, seeing none, number nine, 
announcements of upcoming meetings. We heard about the upcoming policy committee meeting. Uh, Michael mentioned the February 26th finance workshop, which is our regular workshop, but that's when. I believe that was the finance workshop. Oh, that's a <laughs> no finance. That's when um, the the budget process for the for, for, from the school board's standpoint will begin. Um, and there's a meeting the following day on the 27th of the Community Services Advisory Committee, which may be relevant to some thinking that we're doing about community services. Are there other meetings? Excuse me, a technology meeting. I don't have the date, so we have to look at the website. I'm sorry. Um, but in March, there'll be an upcoming. We have to look. I, I so there's a the March date. meeting of the technology committee related to the development of the technology plan, plan for the district. Yes. OK. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Um, if there are no other meetings, then may I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Seven. Thank you. Thank you, John.